Um, hey, everybody. Welcome to SedsCast. Um, I'm Sahil Farishta, your host for today. Joining me is your host, uh, co-host, Chad Sarudi. Chad, how are you feeling today? Doing pretty good. I've done a lot of homework, but I'm ready to have this meeting today. I'm really excited for our guest. Oh, I'm super excited as well. Um, today, we'll be talking to Dr. Lindy Elkins-Tanton, the principal investigator for the NASA Psyche mission, um, the ASU vice president for the Interplanetary Initiative, and the co-founder for Beagle Learning. How are you doing today, Lindy? I'm very well, thanks. Thanks an awful lot for inviting me on. Yeah, no, thank you so much for agreeing. We're super excited to have you on. Um, can't wait to hear about all the stuff you've done, including NASA Psyche. It's uh, it's crazy. This uh, The mission is so much fun, and we're right in the middle of getting ready. Yep. Yeah. All right. So can you start off by just telling us about yourself, um, your education, any previous roles that you've been doing, and then what your current role looks like, especially, you know, with regards to the Psyche mission? For sure. Uh, so I am a professor at Arizona State University right now, running our interplanetary initiative, um, although my biggest job is definitely uh, uh, the Psyche mission. Um, previously, I was a director of the Carnegie Institution for Science in Washington, D.C., and before that, I was professor at MIT, and before that, I was a research associate at Brown, and before that, I was getting my Ph.D. at MIT. So I got all my degrees at MIT, but between my master's and my Ph.D., I took 10 years out, and I worked in business, and uh, that was um, not, it's, it's, it's a little bit more common now, but it was a little bit less common then. I mean, not that I'm like a billion years old. I just finished my PhD in 2002, but, um, hmm. but uh, it, it, kind of, it, it turned out that although it wasn't really recommended from a science career point of view, it ended up being incredibly helpful for my career, the things that I learned when I was working in business. And so I'm a big fan of the, of the varied career path. Cool. Yeah, that's really good to know. Um, I going through and kind of researching you beforehand too, we saw this whole long career path that you had of going through all these different steps and taking a break to go to business and then coming back in. But what would you say that it really was that kind of started out like your passion for space and like that kind of bug? How did you get into the space industry to, to begin with? You know, yeah, it's, um, I, I would tell you, I have such an interesting time with that question, which I get, of course, all the time. Like, when did you know that you needed to mm -hmm. run a mission and that it was your destiny? Well, I will tell you that I ask people when I give public lectures, a lot of times I ask, they're all people who love planets and they're really, you know, astronomers at heart or planetary scientists mm -hmm. who want to be astronauts. And, and I ask them, what was the formative moment in your life that you just knew that this was your passion? And for usually like a third of the people, a big number, um, it's because they saw Saturn or Jupiter through a telescope when they were like 10 or 11 years old. Um, I don't know if it's true for you guys um, or if that was formative in some way. Uh, it, it is a really profound experience. And I also had that experience. But um, but as I'm fond of saying, I still wanted to be a veterinarian afterwards. And so <laughs> and really, like, I got into the natural sciences are really what I love. I'm really kind of fascinated with every way that we try to understand the world around us and what we can see. And, uh, and so I really started out in geology and geophysics, but the problems I was addressing turned out were very pertinent to planetary formation. And so I kept kind of going in that direction because it was so interesting and kind of wildly poetic to think about the magma ocean stage of rocky planets when the exterior was entirely molten, when our planets were just balls of magma in space. And to, I mean, that is really fun to think about. And then how do you come to be a habitable planet after that kind of start? And so as I went down that pathway and kept working on how planets form and what were the precursors to our Earth and how do you become habitable, um, there came this opportunity to test our hypotheses with a mission. And so that's how it came about. It came about in this kind of sideways way. That's really cool. That's definitely more interesting than I just saw Jupiter through a telescope. That's <laughs> so much more scientific and impressive. Yeah, I mean, personally, and Sahir, you can talk about it too. I grew up in Florida. So yeah. I grew up watching rocket launches, having them in my backyard. Well, there so you that go. kind of like whole experience. It's similar to the Jupiter and seeing that through a telescope, but so yeah, profound. Definitely louder and more physical <laughs> yeah. experience. Right, right. You can, really can't ignore it. It's like you can look yeah. away from Jupiter, but not from a rocket launch that's yeah, happening. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that is on my to-do list to go see a bunch of rocket launches like that. 
my my story wasn't you know quite as profound it wasn't seeing saturn you know in the telescope but it was really more just learning about stars you know stargazing with my family and then also seeing saturn in a picture book um i did not own a telescope growing up so i did not see it in a telescope at the first time i saw you know this massive two-page fold of saturn and i'm just like right that exists wow Somebody asked me the other day, if you could go anywhere in space, what would it be? And, um, and for me, it, I mean, it's totally surreal, because this is literally not possible with today's technology, but I want to fly around the rings of Saturn. I mean, wouldn't yeah. that be just so amazing? Be yeah. insane. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. So, um, you know, we, we mentioned that uh, you're currently um, working on the Psyche mission. Uh, can you briefly explain, you know, what the Psyche mission is and uh, your role in it, especially, you know, make sure that all of our listeners know about um, what the Psyche mission is. For sure. Yeah, Psyche, um, it's the same name as the goddess Psyche. So it's P-S-Y-C-H-E. And Psyche is both the name of an asteroid orbiting out in the main belt between Mars and Jupiter. And it's also the name of our mission to go visit that asteroid. Uh, The asteroid is named Psyche because it was named that by its discoverer back in the mid-19th century, the the first person who saw it through a telescope in that very early few decades of people discovering asteroids. And uh, they were all named after gods and goddesses. And so that's how Psyche got the name. So why Psyche out of the million, two million asteroids that we have in our solar system? Like, why is that one the one? Well, we think that it's mostly made of metal. We think that it is the largest and roundest of the metal asteroids of which there might be only about nine out of those several million asteroids that we know of. Only about nine right now we know of that are candidates to be metallic. And this is by far the biggest one. So Psyche is the size of Massachusetts. Like if you kind of lined it up next to Massachusetts, a little bit smaller than Switzerland. You can kind of cover most of Switzerland with Psyche. So it's a big asteroid. It's not really round. It's kind of shaped like a potato. But it's a kind of world that humans have never investigated. You know, we've gone to rocky worlds like the moon and Mars and Venus and Mercury, and, and we've gone to moons that, and to, uh, to gas giants and to icy moons, but we've never been to a metallic place before. So this is a new kind of exploration. And, uh, and I do need to put in my official disclaimer, which I always give, which is I'm going to tell you everything that we think we know right now about Psyche, but we're probably wrong. And so, and so you can start, you can start saying, I told you so right now, because I can tell you when we get there, it's going to be something different and surprising and new that we've never seen before. Yeah. Right. That's the point of the mission is that if we knew everything ahead of time, just by observations from like back here on earth, why would we even go bother going to these places? Yeah. Why would we even go? Right. But there's so much that we cannot discover from earth and we have this miraculous way. And I think everyone who's an engineer begins to have a, an appreciation for what a really actually miraculous step in human evolution it is that we can build something so complicated that there's no one person on the project who understands the whole thing. And yet it's going to work faultlessly in space for years without a repair person. I mean, that is amazing. Yeah. Yeah, It's amazing. It really is. And so as the primary uh, investigator of the project, what is your like main function on the team? Mm. Well, so a a good way to um, kind of back into that question is to explain that there are different um, categories of NASA missions. Um, The very, very biggest ones, the flagship missions, are concepts that come from the decadal survey. So every 10 years, the community comes together and does this gigantic planning process, and they have a top recommendation for the most difficult gigantic mission to do. So the Perseverance rover that's going to land on Mars in two weeks not to make sure that this 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 cast is never evergreen. So two weeks from now, that is landing on Mars. And that is a flagship mission from the last decadal survey, which I was on. I was on the Mars panel and helped to pick that. And then there are below that level of dollar value, so to speak, there are competed missions where the science community gets together with the engineering community and the private sector, and they pitch to NASA ideas for missions. And so um, the two biggest of the competed missions are the New Frontiers missions and the Discovery missions. And Psyche is a Discovery mission. So back in 2011, I got an email from a couple of scientists at JPL saying, we read your paper. It's a paper I wrote with Ben Weiss at MIT and Murray Zuber at MIT. And and they said, uh, we really like what you're writing about. We think it's really interesting. And we, we think we should get together and propose a mission to test our hypothesis. And I was like, mind blown. I'm in. Let's do this. Uh, what do we do? Where do we start? 
because uh, I had not been, I'd been involved in um, committees to support missions, but I had never been on a flight mission before on a flight project. So we started down that road and um, uh, it turned out to be, it's been honestly the biggest adventure and pleasure and challenge of my life by far. Even just the proposal process would have counted as that before we were even selected. And we worked for um, six years before we were selected in 2017. And the first um, uh, five of those years are volunteer. And so you're working really, really hard with big teams. You have to convince a NASA center with, for us, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, to team with you. Then you have to convince an industry partner. We chose Maxar to team with you. Then you have to put together your science team. And you have to choose what science you can answer. What questions can we answer? And, and, and that depends upon what measurements can we possibly make. And that depends upon what kinds of science instruments exist that we can fly and then get data back from a robotic spacecraft. And so you put together your whole traceability matrix, as it's called, and everyone in engineering knows what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And you work on it for a long time. We were on version, I think, 72 by the time we passed in our first proposal. So that first wow. proposal was uh, 250 pages, and we had about 40 people working on it, and we were one of 28. And uh, we were never going to be selected. We never because uh, first of all, you never selected the first time through. You have to kind of like zone refine your proposal through multiple seven-year proposal cycles. And um, so we were not going to be selected because we were new. We we're not going to be selected because I was a first-time principal investigator because Maxar had never been NASA's partner for deep space before. So that was a new industry provider. Uh, and they were giving us a firm fixed price rather than cost plus in, in contract terms. And so we agreed ahead of time what it was going to cost. And that was it. Firm fixed price. That's really rare um, for oh, the wow. And plus, we're a small body mission. And a lot of people are saying, ah, nobody's really interested in asteroids, you know, and there's too many of them, they're all the same or whatever the reason. And so, so we thought we'd done a great job and we handed in that big proposal and we went home and kind of said, you know, that was great, we'll maybe try again next time. And then we got this call, you've been down selected, you're one of the five. So out of 28, there were five. And then they give you, oh my God, what a moment that was. I couldn't even believe it. And you could imagine like, you can imagine how the rumor mill goes. So, you know, you, as the day's coming closer, you think you know what day they're going to make the announcement. You don't know for sure. It's going to be this week, maybe it'll be Monday. And suddenly you start getting these emails like, so-and-so got a call. We heard that, you know, this team got a call and they heard no. And like, oh my gosh, who else? And, and, and you know, your phone is ringing and the messages are flying back and forth and everybody's trying to get the rumor mill together. And suddenly your phone rings and it's NASA. And they say, you've been selected for step two. <laughs> And that was really surreal because I really did not expect it. And I was totally cool with that. Like we did a great job and this is how this game is played. So then we get a bunch of money to do step two, all five of us. So finally there's money. And step two is crazy intense. So, so David O, who's our lead systems engineer, brilliant, brilliant human being and was with us in this phase. And he and I also, neither of us had been through this phase before. And so, and so NASA says, we're going to give you $3 million and you have nine months to write a concept study, which is a very detailed document, uh, almost a thousand pages of everything about the mission. And David and I looked at each other and we go, oh, that's a ton of money. We can do all these test beds. We can do all these engineering models. And JPL goes, no, you can't. You don't even have enough money. You need $5 million to do this. Don't worry, we'll put it all together with all the different groups. And so all the partners come together. And it turns out it is absolutely nonstop work for nine months to write this thing. And then you have a site visit with the professional review panel, which is, uh, uh, I mean, it's, I, I, I say that it's like, it's like your PhD qualifying exam on steroids done as a Hollywood super production. Like there's art and graphics and you repaint stuff. There's a banner down the front of the building. And we decided to do it at Maxar in, in Palo Alto. The whole team moves there for a whole week. So by the end of the week, we had 140 people on the team running this site visit. And, uh, and you answer questions all week. And this was another moment where David and I. So the first thing that happens is you get an encrypted email on day one with all these questions from the review panel. And some of them you have to answer in writing and some you have to present in person on the seventh day. And David and I are like seven days to answer questions, no problem. But then we remembered, these are all the questions that were not answered in 1200 pages of documentation. So these are the really hard questions. And some of them are unanswered 
anywhere in the world. Like we had to create new science. We had to create new engineering. We had to produce new concepts and do new models to answer these things. And so everyone's working, you know, 12 hours a day, getting ready for the presentation. You go through that day, which, I mean, we don't even have enough time for me to talk about this. It's insane. <laughs> <laughs> like the night before, Maxar went around and oiled every single chair so that no one's chair when they pushed away from the table. And like we had a professional speech coach helping us know how to give a presentation people could understand. Mm -hmm. All the documentarians and the graphic designers. We had a red team in the back room that duplicated the expertise of the main team so that while we're in front talking to the review panel, they can be working up answers in the back. We had runners, like crazy. And also so much fun. Oh my gosh, so much fun. And then you go home and then it's just like crickets. You're not meeting with your team every second. You're just quiet and got a couple of months. Oh, we did go and present at NASA headquarters to the um, and to the uh, uh, associate administrator, to Thomas Zerbuchman. And then you just go home and you just wait again. And, uh, and, and for me, that was one of those, oh, I mean, how would you say it? Like a growth moment maybe? <laughs> Sure. So, so my, my husband and I um, were up, we have a little house in the hills of Western Massachusetts and we were up there. Like we tend to go over the holidays and um, I knew that I was going to get a call from NASA headquarters on a given day. And we even had a time. I knew the time they were going to call me to tell me the answer because up there we've got a landline with, and my, and, and my cell phone doesn't really work very well. And so they had to call the landline and they had to call the time when I was home because I couldn't carry it around with me. So I, we had to set the time. And I knew that I was going to get a yes or a no on that moment. And that all of these six years worth of work on the part of now hundreds of people, we were going to know. And, um, and then it turned out my husband had to go to a math conference, didn't have to go, but he had a great math conference. Sure, yeah. <laughs> Which always happens. He that left you for a little bit to go to the math conference. Yeah, he was like, you know, hang out, I'll be back. So, uh, so he goes to this conference every year at that time. It's important for his field. So off the end, we knew that was, this was cool. And my son who's grown was, you know, back at his house. So I was there up in the hills by myself and it was all snowy out and totally silent. We're in the middle of nowhere, just the forest around. And so I had to really kind of, um, coach myself into a state of calm and acceptance, no matter what happens. And I felt this huge, um, what uh, uh, indebtedness to JPL and to Maxar because here they are trying to win their first deep space mission. And there is a lot to this, right? When you got this kind of money on the line, so much investment of time. And then of course, all the scientists and engineers and everyone who worked on it. So I was trying to kind of be okay if we didn't win, like we really did our best and I was okay. So I went, I, you know, I got to that point, like that Zen-like point for at least like a second nice. in my life. <laughs> and so I went to bed the night before and I went to sleep. And I slept really well. And I was sound asleep when the phone rang because he called early. <laughs> of course. <laughs> no. no of course. I'm totally not ready for this. Suddenly my cell phone starts ringing and I'm like, what? What? No. And I was totally asleep and in bed. And which is not the way you want to take a call from the associate administrator of NASA. Oh, you be fully yeah, right, sure. cool, sitting up. You want to have had your coffee. You want to feel in charge. You not know, like laying <laughs> down in bed. So, um, and then of course, because they don't have good cell coverage, it kept cutting out. He's like, Lindy, this is Thomas. And then it was, <laughs> and so I'm trying to say, call me on the landline, call me on the landline. So <laughs> after like three of these totally embarrassing fails, feeling like somehow it's my fault, he called me on the landline. So then, and then he could say, you're going to be glad I called you. And then I knew we won. And, uh, uh, which was, and, and then immediately he said, and I think we have to completely redo your student collaborations. I want to be much more widespread. I want to be much more audacious. I want to do something mm. organic. Like, let's start planning right now. And I'm like, wait, go back to that other thing where I'm glad. You <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you won the project. But no, your student, you got to yeah, collaborate but, more. Like, just blew over the. It totally. You know, blow over the seven right. years of work. Let's get down to business. We don't have time for this, you know, back to work. So um, that's what happened. And uh and, and so to, one thing just to add in here before I stop talk telling this story, because I'm sure there's other things we should talk about. Um, we really did plan some very audacious student collaborations and we're really proud of it. And so we've already had more than 500 students involved with the mission, even though we're just four years in. And so uh, very excited about that. And then, uh, and then the other part of what happened right in that moment was it changed the rest of my life. That's what happened. <laughs> That's absolutely amazing. That is a, a fantastic story. I'm so glad, you know, 
to hear that, you know, despite waking up in bed and every, you know, going through that Zen and then everything going wrong right after that, but then, you know, everything turns out absolutely amazing. It and does. It was, there aren't that many unalloyed, wonderful moments in life. And uh, yeah. this was one of them. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, talking a little bit more recently about good news, you know, uh, we recently heard that um, Psyche was approved to move into the phase V of the Yay. program, which is like the final part, uh, if, I, if I'm correct, uh, before it launches. That's right. Um, That's right. So yeah, congratulations. So thank you so much. Right, that press release just came out and we went through that decisional meeting last week. Um, uh, like as in with everything NASA, it's an acronym. It was KDPD, Key Decision Point D. And, <laughs> and so I'm getting a little better with acronyms, but Ben Weiss, my buddy from MIT, he and I started this whole thing together. In our first meetings out at JPL, when we're getting this going, we just used to write acronyms all over our hands and then go look them up later because we had no idea what anyone was talking about. I'm sure, yeah. yeah. That's really and half the time, you don't even know if you just misheard them or if it was an No, you have no idea. And then you're looking and they're like, well, there's five choices for this acronym. Let's guess which one it is. Um, <laughs> but, and so, so I'm constantly still asking people to stop and describe acronyms. And my favorite is when they don't know what the acronym stands for because it's become the noun. Like everyone knows what mm -hmm. it means. But nobody knows what it stands for anymore. It's just a new word. So, yeah. Yeah, so KDPD. So now we're in phase D, which is assembly, test, and launch operations. Almost all of KDPD is what we call ATLO, the other, the other acronym, assembly, test, and launch operations. So we are 18 months out from launch, and um, things are just heating up and speeding up in the most astonishing way. And... Um, I'm really, really glad to be able to say to you today that we are still on track to launch in August of 2022, as has been planned now for years. That's been our, our launch date, and we've got a really plan to that date. Um, COVID has been a giant challenge for us because you can't make hardware virtually over Zoom. You have to have people in the shop making the hardware. <laughs> and and that's what we've been, and we've been building, right? We've been building. Mm -hmm. And um this is a really big project. Uh, uh, if you include the launch vehicle, it's it's over nine hundred million dollars, and so the part of the the budget that is under the principal investigator control is about eight hundred fifty million dollars. And there's a lot of hardware in there, and it's a big spacecraft. And so we've got big contractors, and they have contractors, and the contractors have contractors, and they have subcontractors mm -hmm. and sub subcontractors down to the piece parts and the pieces and the parts, and so. You know, I can encourage our team to keep going and feel good and stick it out and be safe and do social distancing and not get sick. But you can't do that for everybody in the trickle down of all the people because you don't even know who they are. Um, and 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 so, you know, we've had a couple of shops close down from COVID temporarily and then open up again. And everybody's doing their best. And we keep kind of rejiggering the schedule to take care of those slips and, and just waiting for the each subsequent hardware delivery to come into our hands where we feel better about it. <laughs> now we can control what happens. So, so yeah, so our ATLO um, starts in a month and uh, the spacecraft is, is coming down to Jet Propulsion Laboratory and all of that is going to start being integrated. And it's incredibly exciting and also nerve wracking and intense. I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure that has to be, I'll, I'll, again, like, all of the work that you've been doing for the last seven, eight years, kind of coming together, oh. going to half, I'm sure issues will pop up, but you'll go yeah. through, you'll figure them out, get them to work. And That's then, what I hope so far so good. Yeah. Yeah. And then you launch it. And then what, like, I was curious. So the mission will take four years, I think it is, to get to Psyche once it launches. What do you do in that four year time span? Like, I'm su assuming you're not sitting there twiddling your thumbs if you have <laughs> something to do. What actually yeah. goes on in that kind of time period? So it's pro so we don't know for sure because it actually varies on exactly what date we launch, but it'll okay. probably be about 3.4 years. So see, it's not anywhere near as big a deal as you thought in terms of what do you do. <laughs> yeah, right. sure. only, yeah. Only <laughs> the last couple of years. years. Now it's really past. Right. I get it now. <laughs> right. So so the first thing, uh, I mean, obviously, there are the key bits like checkout and testing of all the different things and all the different systems. And mm -hmm. uh, I am constantly fascinated and kind of obsessed with the level of detail that has to be attended to. My favorite detail from this week, we had a um, preliminary design review um, for the launch vehicle, 
which is a Falcon Heavy. So we're there on with SpaceX for two days straight with a preliminary design review, which just that by itself is very exciting to me. And um, my favorite tiny detail was um, one of the requirements we write is um, is uh, the rate of rotation that's allowed at tip off. So when we are released um, from the launch vehicle, the spacecraft is released, you're only allowed to have a certain speed of rotation around each axis because then the spacecraft's got to be able to stabilize, find mm-hmm. the sun, and turn, you know, open the solar arrays and all the rest of it. So the tip off rotation rate requirement was my favorite one of that day. So a lot of what we're going to do after launch is taking care of all of those things, I mean, doing all the checkout. And then we have a really interesting period while we're going out. Um, we have what's called a planetary launch, meaning that our launch is constrained by the positions of the planets. In our case, okay. it's Mars. So we need a Mars gravity assist to do what we need to do. So we have basically have a launch opportunity every 26 months because that's the Mars cadence, right? So we're going to head out toward Mars. And while we're doing that, we're going to be testing our technology demonstration instrument, the Deep Space Optical Com. So here's the next acronym, DSOC is what it's called. All right. So this, uh, yeah, yeah DSOC. <laughs> This is the coolest thing in the world. So this is an entirely separable from the science mission. It really has nothing to do with what we're doing Psyche for. It's a tech demo for human spaceflight. It's a tech demo for using laser communications instead of radio communications. And the goal is that we would be able to use them between Earth and Mars. So the fact that we're doing a Mars gravity assist is kind of perfect because we get to test the deep space optical comm. And so all this time while we're going out near and by Mars, there are going to be these multiple opportunities for a special sending laser on Earth to send a laser up to Psyche mission. The DSOC will measure it, detect it, and send a laser message back down to another fantastic receiver here on Earth built just for it. And so that's what we're going to be doing a lot of the time is to go around Mars. And, uh, and then we're going to be puttering off uh, toward, toward Psyche using our slow but ultra-efficient um, hull thrusters mm-hmm. um, and, and using xenon as our propellant. That's absolutely fantastic. I love to see that new technology being used. Um, one thing that, you know, I really wanted to touch on is that a lot of the people that, you know, we talk to are often the engineers. And then they say, okay, you know, we made this beautiful rover. It landed. Cool. Next mission. But yeah. for you, you know, not only have you seen this entire mission, you know, from conception all the way to, you know, where it lands, and I'm sure, you know, you're going to be a part of it. But, you know, as the science background, you know, I imagine the real fun comes, you know, when you start getting those readings back and you start saying, oh, we were so wrong about those facts. I can't wait to be wrong. Yeah. So I guess, um, you know, talk to us a little bit about how your role is going to change, you know, once we start getting there, you know, yeah. get the data and, you know, how that's all going to be. <laughs> It, it is going to be different, and, and it, um, it ties back to a question you asked earlier, which is, what is my role? You know, in the end, my role is mission assurance, in a sense. I literally sign my name on the line to NASA that if I know a reason that our level one requirements will not be met and our mission will not be successful, I will cancel it. I will stop. So I have that responsibility, which means I've got to keep track of everything so I'll have a clue, basically. Yeah, sure. I'll do my best. Yeah. And then another thing that I think is really important that I'm doing now is um, working with the leadership of the mission across the board on team culture. I just want to really always make it one team. So in this team, we are not the scientists and the engineers. And then maybe there's also budgeters and marketers and graphic designers and all the rest of it. We're one team. Like everybody needs to know all the same information. Everyone needs to be communicating. Everyone comes to meetings together. It's been really important to hear every voice. And you guys know how important this is that if the person who is like seven rungs down, who is actually building the part, understands that there's a wrong calculation, they have to feel free to speak up. They have to know that in our motto, you know, bad news is the best news is bad news brought early so that they will not be punished for telling us that something is wrong. Um, and so trying to set that culture is really important. And, and so right now my job is um, uh, 10 to 12 hours of meetings a day and communications around the mission, and then working on the team, trying to understand all the parts, communicating between Marshall and JPL and Maxar and ASU and our 20 other partners and headquarters back and forth all the time, uh, trying to keep all that information flowing and um, and making decisions about what needs to be done next and working with our project manager, Henry Stone, who's a genius, fabulous guy. And then as we get out there toward the science part, then it becomes more of a science management situation. 
So we're going to be getting in this tons of data, and it's all going to come through our data center at Arizona State University. And by the way, we have got a pipeline being built that is going to put our images on the internet within a half hour of our receipt. So we're not going to hold anything back. Everything we see, the whole world can see for free immediately, because um, I feel like that's what space should be. And then, and then we have to figure out how we take our data and make it into knowledge. And we have a lot of ideas about that. We've been planning it already, of course, from the very beginning. What measurements do we take? What do they mean? If you measure this, it means that. And if you measure that, it means this. And you put this data together with that data to make that decision. So we've been laying out all of that structure and getting the science team ready to receive the data and interpret it and start to write papers. Um, but more broadly than that also, than just the arbitration and the diplomacy within the team to make sure everybody's highly functioning and we're getting those results out, the other part I think that's really important for my job when we're there on the science is communicating it with the world and encouraging the whole team to do that too. Because uh, if there's any reason, the primary reason, okay, the primary reason we go is to learn fundamental science, but my secret primary reason that we go is to inspire everyone on earth to be bolder and braver and to know that if we can do this miraculous thing and learn about this distant asteroid, then we can fix the problems we have here. And so I really want it to be accessible to everyone. So that's my other job. Yeah, I think that is such an important thing and such a, like, there's only a couple industries, I feel like, where you can really say that too, where the challenges that you're facing are so extreme and involve so much planning and creative thought that when you can solve that and you prove it, it is so inspiring for everyone else that watches it happen. That you just so get inspired yeah. or so it's like when you watch like an inspiring movie or listen to a motivational speaker, it's that same exact effect. Like, yes, I can saying, do it. They were able to do that. I can do that too. I can go and fix whatever I needed in my life. Yeah. Exactly. That. That's really what the message should be. And the message is not that any person is a hero and somehow different than you. Because every mm -hmm. single person working on this mission is the same as you. We just plotted along our path relentlessly. <laughs> And that's that's how you get to these things. Yeah. yeah. And so I know we're running a little short on time. Um, so one of the main things, we are a student-run and student-focused podcast. So we'd like to ask uh, if you have any advice for students. And I know you've gone through a whole slew of career paths and a lot of that. Yeah. So what is your advice for students who are interested, A, in kind of getting into like NASA missions and are interested in NASA themselves? Mm -hmm. And also for people who might have had or might be considered having a non-traditional career path like you might have yeah. uh, described yourself as having. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, okay, so a couple of different pieces of advice that I, um, I, I, I hesitate a little bit to call them advice. I'm going to tell you this is my experience, and maybe it will sure. be useful to you because <laughs> I'm not sure it's <laughs> advice. Um, one piece of experience from my own life is that um, I, I was discouraged from a certain – career path in college because I didn't get top grades in one of my courses. I just found the topic very difficult. And I, in retrospect, I realized that was a stupid reason not to pursue it. And that, and that in the end, um, whether you get A's or C's is much less important than your sense of passion and determination. And it sounds a little trite, but it is actually 100% true. Uh, and the thing that has to go along with that passion and determination is, um, uh, your own self-determined concept of quality. You have to be determined that you know what a quality product is and that you are going to deliver that. And that is really what drives you forward. So I would say that if you have that passion and you're willing to work on that sense of quality, you can go anywhere you want. And NASA, of course, does not have only astronauts and mechanical engineers and aero engineers, right? They're every kind of job that you could ever need is uh, or that you could ever imagine is needed by someone in the aerospace industry. It's needed by NASA or it's needed by SpaceX or Blue or it's needed by these small, like like uh, tough startups making these amazing kinds of space hardware. So you could be a graphic designer, you could be a budgeter. You could, oh my gosh, the guy, the MBA who keeps, who's the lead on the business office for, J, for Psyche Mission, the guy is a crazy genius budget person and, and we rely on him utterly. Uh, and so no matter what it is that you're good at, there's a, there's a place for you in this industry if you want there to be. Um, and I wouldn't worry about um, 
changing your mind about what you want to do. Uh, you know, you don't have to only do one thing for your whole life. Maybe that seems really obvious, but it's not obvious to everyone. And it's also not ever obvious to everyone's parents. <laughs> <laughs> that's like an important piece of piece a little important message there um and that you bring different skills along depending on what you learned in your last place so the things i learned in business that i brought back to academia things like how to negotiate or how to organize teams of people how to write um a pro forma like how do you do budgeting looking ahead those are not things that i learned in my undergraduate and i was not taught them in graduate school luckily i learned them in business because i absolutely needed them for every Thing I did after that, because when you're running your science lab or your engineering lab, or you're going and doing a startup, or you're working on a mission, those are the skills you absolutely need. You need to know how to hire people and fire them, and you need to know how to motivate and organize teams, and you need to understand how to handle money. And so, if those are things you learn in a side track before you come back, they will be very valuable. Yeah, it's not even a side track at that point. It's just you were gaining exactly. the skills that you needed to do to do the job that you ultimately wanted to get into. Exactly. And I, and I know that, um, that between the two of you, there's engineering and business and some science, and those are all things that you need. And so that's really great. Yeah. I always love to hear how space is like, you know, every example where it's like, yes, yeah, space is multidisciplinary. We need everybody. It just always makes me feel like, yes, that's fantastic. We're definitely on the right track there. Can I say one other thing, which is really aimed at, at students? This is the purpose of our interplanetary initiative at ASU, is to think about positive human space f- futures in a way that we bring together all disciplines. And the, the reason that I think this is important is because, not just because I love space or I think it's inspirational, but because an awful lot of the narratives that we hear on Earth right now are guilt narratives or fear narratives. It's been a tough year, right? There's a lot of doubts and a lot of fears about society. Something that space gives us is a sense of hope and potential for who we could be. You know, we could go and explore space as the humankind that we should be instead of the humankind that we sometimes see making mistakes. And and so to me, thinking about future space exploration is actually a way to think about how do we help humankind evolve faster into a better group of people. So that's what I hope. And I count on all of you to do it, basically. That's absolutely we'll inspiring. Best. Yeah, we'll definitely try our best. Thank you so much for coming on. It was absolutely a pleasure to have you and talk to you today. Well, you guys are great interviewers, and I think SEDS is fantastic, and I'm really glad you invited me. Thank you very much.